Yes. Uh, okay. Hello, namaste, and good afternoon. This is Manashwi, and on behalf of Foroptum, I welcome you all to our Foroptum e-learning session. The Foroptum e-learning session is an initiative by Foroptum, and it is an interactive program where we discuss optometry topics. This session is live on YouTube, and if you have any queries, you can type them out in the conversation box, and we will be discussing the questions after the presentation. Today, we have Mr. Kiyor Savla, who will be speaking on the topic myopia management. A brief introduction to our speaker here, Mr. Kiyor Savla has completed his Bachelor's of Optometry from Lotus College of Optometry in India in 2016. He then worked as a faculty at the Wavikar Eye Institute before getting accepted to the University of Alabama at Birmingham for a PhD. He is currently rising fourth year student under Dr. Andrew Pucker, working on toric multifocal contact lenses for myopia control. So on behalf of our Optum team, I welcome you, sir. Um, thank you, Manashwi, and I would also like to thank the Foroptum team for this opportunity. Um, I, uh, I have worked with um, myopia management in terms of research uh, all the way since 2015, I believe. So it's been a long journey so far, and uh, it's also my passion, and I intend to continue pursuing myopia management as research and clinically in the future. And so... Uh, that's that's basically about me. And uh, without further ado, let's dive straight into the topic. So myopia management uh, is, again, relatively new as a topic, standalone topic. We've had myopia management as different parts of different topics like contact lenses, dispensing optics, etc. Uh, for a long time, but it hasn't been um, combined into a cohesive course yet in a lot of places. In USA especially, it is now being worked into as a separate topic. And so this is, a, this is the forefront um, of managing um, refractive errors, especially myopia. And I will speak in detail about why um, anyone who is an optometrist currently practicing optometrist clinically or in terms of research or academics should be uh, learning about this and be interested in detail about this as we go ahead. So um, starting with, I would like to cover what is myopia and its treatment. This is just a basic overview in case you, if you haven't looked at the books in a really long time, but if you are in the field, you should know what is myopia and its current treatment options. Um, then I would dive straight into uh, what is myopia management, the different management options we have, uh, the current advances in the field of myopia management, and what is like the latest research uh, that we are looking at and studying about. And uh, then we might look at a two case studies. And lastly, I would provide you with more resources because this uh, topic or this um, talk is in no way conclusive of all the myopia management information out there. There is a lot of information out there with like up to thousands of researchers working every day to find more information um, to ensure that our patients get the best uh, uh, treatment that is possible and available out there. So yeah, I will provide you with some resources that are very clinical specific, uh, clinic specific uh, and that might help you uh, build on your practice if you decide to delve into this in further detail uh, later on in the future. So uh, let's start with the exact, like the basics or um, the most common <coughs> question, not co common question, but the basic question. Um, and uh, th the points that I really want you to take away from this whole talk is to remember that um, by 2050, one out of, <coughs> excuse me, one out of every two individuals uh, we will have myopia, that is, and one out of every 10 individuals will have high myopia. So if you can think of at least two individuals in your life, um, imagine that by 2050, one of them will have myopia. And as an optometrist, refraction and refractive error is a big part of our work. And that's the big part of the service that we provide to our community. And if you are um, going to be an optometrist, practicing optometrist going forward, it's important that you understand or learn about this topic 
so that you can treat these patients as there will be a lot of them as per the current trends. Uh, the objectives or the goal of this talk, uh, topic or this talk is to understand the importance of myopia management primarily, and that will also help you um, tell your patients or your subjects about the importance of this as the awareness is still not up there. Uh, it is it is still in pro process and the understanding is not there and the awareness is not there as it's supposed to be. And at the same time, it will help, uh, help you understand clinical management of patients with myopia. So um, the first question is, what is myopia? Well, myopia, as we all know, uh, is also known as nearsightedness. And it occurs when parallel rays of light coming from infinity form a focus in front of the retina or the fovea. Uh, parallel rays of light could be from six meters or 20 feet. Uh, whatever you have studied is all applicable to this definition. Uh, but also to remember the second half of the definition is that the accommodation has to be relaxed for this to happen. So as you can see in the image, uh, rays of light are forming a focus, which is way ahead of the fovea or where the focus is supposed to be formed. Clinically, the two things that you will see when someone has myopia uh, is uh, the most important signs you would see is that their distance vision is blurred and their near vision is clear. And that's a very telltale sign um, that someone might have a refractive error if there is no other issue. Um, but that is all I would speak about what is myopia. Next, I would. Uh, talk a little bit about what we might have studied in school uh, if myopia management is not a separate topic per se um, and has been glanced upon or what we are currently actually practicing in a lot of places in terms of treatment for myopia. And this ranges for anyone uh, who has myopia all the way from like a six month old baby um, to like a hundred year old gentleman. Uh, so first is using single vision spectacle lenses. We prescribe spectacles and uh, the other is prescribing single vision contact lenses. And the last is refractive surgeries, which have certain limitations to them. But these are primarily our treatment modalities so far for uh, treating my anyone with myopia. Um, and that is where also the problem lies because treating myopia is not difficult. Anyone who knows how to do refractive, uh, how to how to do subjective and objective refraction can prescribe efficiently any of these modalities uh, and the patient will be alleviated with their from with their symptoms so they will not have any other issues and they can go about their life normally wearing spectacles um, or contact lenses but that is that is where uh, the issue comes in is the patient's mentality, if I can wear spectacles or contact lenses or get this refractive error surgery done and be rid of contact lenses and spectacles. Um, it is difficult to convince the patient or the subject saying why you need this additional treatment, what is the importance of this additional treatment. And this is what the first uh, significant part of this talk is going to be about, is understanding the importance of myopia management. Before we delve into the importance of myopia management. Let's just talk briefly about what is exactly myopia management. Uh, what, what does one mean when one says, okay, I'm going to do myopia management. Uh, myopia management, also known as myopia control, refers not only to the symptomatic relief of myopia, wherein you provide the glasses and the areometropia is gone, and now they can see everything distance near clearly, but also, uh, it refers to the different ways to ensure that the myopia progresses slowly. Um, now, when I say myopia progresses slowly, um, these terminologies are very, very important, especially when you're talking to your patients or subjects. Um, you are not saying that you're going to stop myopia, but you're going to manage it. That is, we are trying to reduce the progression of myopia, which in this case, if you are, suppose if you have two diopters of myopia today, and you're expecting in about a year's time, the myopia to become two more diopters, that is four diopters in total. So you're trying to reduce that additional two diopters to 1.5 or one diopter or 0.5 diopters. And that is what myopia management is. We are no way, in no way claiming that we will stop the progression of myopia completely. And uh, it is a tricky topic at the same time because there are a lot of factors 
that come into play when we speak about myopia control or myopia management. And as you can see on the sli slide, there's like corneal reshaping or orthokeratology, multifocal contact lenses, um, eye drops, uh, multifocal spectacle, lifestyle modification. And these are so many factors that um, no wonder the patients are confused as to what this all is about because it's not a simple okay, you wear glasses and you're done. But at the same time, it is also sometimes confusing and challenging to an optometrist uh, or an eye care practitioner to uh, tackle this whole situation. And that is what we're going to understand. Uh, what is myopia management or what are all these factors and how they interplay with each other and how to best um, guide and prescribe for our patients. So before we dive into that, here are some statistics that will help you uh, strengthen your beliefs and the beliefs of your patient as to what you are doing and why it is important. So what is this need for myopia management or why should our practices focus in developing certain techniques that will help us in the future uh, with dealing with these patients? This study came out in 2016 by Brian Holden Vision Institute uh, from Australia, and it shows the amount of people suffering or having myopia all the way starting from 2000 um, that you can see in this graph um, right here. Um, and all the way, it's predicting all the way up to 2050. Now you can see there are two sections. One is the green section and one is the orange section. Uh, and the green one is just myopia, means anything about 0.5 diopters or higher would be considered as myopia. And the orange one is high myopia, which I believe for this paper was defined as more than five diopters. Um, it is estimated that the population of the world by then would be around 10 billion or uh, 10 hundred crores. Um, and you can see that the graph predicts that we will have around 5 billion, which is 500 crores people worldwide suffering from myopia, um, to be exact 938 million. Uh, these are the people predicted to suffer, uh, sorry, these uh, to be exact uh, 938 million are predicted to suffer from high myopia, which is about 100 crore people. And that is a huge population. Um, the experts in this field and clinicians and government organizations fear that this would be a huge economic burden. Um, and one would wonder why we can just prescribe all of these people with spectacles and um, you know, be done with it. Uh, we don't have to worry about uh, you know, economic burden. Having glasses is not that expensive these days. Uh, the growth rate is like 28%, so it's fast rising. And uh, as I said, half the world is expected to have, um, or 4.76 bill, 4 billion people are expected to have myopia. Uh, yeah. So why can't we just simply prescribe glasses and contact lenses and do refractive error surgeries for all these patients and you know not worry so much about them? What is this cause for concern? Primarily because myopia is also associated with a lot of other diseases. So on this um, table, you can see that um, on the on the left hand side, you can see that there's the amount of myopia. So it's uh, zero diopters, which is emetropic or not myopic. One to three diopters of myopia, three to four, and um, six to eight, and and again, there are these conditions that are listed here, which is cataract, glaucoma, retinal detachment, and myopic mac maculopathy. I will not go into the details of what these conditions are uh, in interest of time, but for an emetropic, if we consider the risk factors of them getting any of these, uh, if it is one, then for someone with one to three diopters of myopia, cataract is twice almost, glaucoma is 1.6 times, retinal detachment is 3.1 times, and um, Myopic maculopathy is 2.2. Uh, jumping to the high myopia category, which is six to eight diopters in this case, cataract is 5.5 times more likely, glaucoma is 2.5 times more likely, retinal detachments, and this is where things get scary, is 21.4 or 21.5 times more likely, and myopic maculopathy is 40.6 times more likely. And this is where everyone is concerned about if all these individuals who have high myopia or even myopia have these increased risk of all of these other diseases. Um, and we know that retinal detachments, myopic maculopathy, these can get very serious very quickly. And so far, we do not have any um, foolproof or reliable treatments or surgeries for this. It's, it's a lot of risk. It's a lot of economic burden. And hence, it's important 
for us as clinicians uh, and practitioners, eye care practitioners today to take care of our community so that in the future, we do not have to deal with these large numbers as these can be devastating economically and um, also like the impact on life. Uh, retinal detachments really, really, really impact the lives a lot as um, the patient has difficulty seeing and visual sense is one of the most used sense any which way. So yeah, this is where the cause for concern is. This is also something that if you feel necessary, you should share with your patients uh, when you're trying to counsel them for myopia management. When you tell them, uh, because the biggest barrier is a lot of patients, if you try and counsel them for myopia management or myopia control, they'll be like, yeah, it's fine. Um, we will do that. One of those laser surgeries once uh, um, he's old enough or she's old enough and uh, we'll, the myopia will be gone and then we, our risks will be zero. And as we learn ahead that that is not the case, um, refractive surgeries might Get, might help you get rid of your contact lenses and spectacles, but they will not help you get rid of all of these risks attached to myopia as you would have already developed myopia by then. So what are these risk factors for this uh, myopia to develop? Um, here is the other piece of the puzzle wherein we do not know a direct answer as to why or how myopia happens because there are a lot of risk factors. Uh, one is genetics age, environment, binocular vision status, refractive error, and a lot more have been identified, but not strongly identified to make strong associations. Um, so there are multiple risk factors, and this, this makes it very tricky for someone to pinpoint or say, okay, this person is going to have it, this person is not going to have it, uh, et cetera. With, if I speak about genetics a little, and this is something you can really share with your patients because they understand genetics at this point. A lot of people understand things that are hereditary. Uh, if one of the two parents has myopia, then it is twice or 2.5 times more likely, um, two to three times more likely that the child will have myopia. If both, if, when we consider both parents being emetropic and we consider the risk factor of one. Uh, if both parents have had myopia, uh, and that means that even if they got their surgeries done, they still had myopia. It doesn't mean if they don't walk in with spectacles or contact lenses that they are myopia free. Uh, so if both parents have had or have myopia currently, uh, then it is likely uh, almost five to six times likely as compared to um, an individual with both emetropic parents that their child will have myopia. So that's a high, high, high uh, risk. Also age matters because at what is the presenting age, generally myopia develops around uh, seven to eight years of age. Uh, and so what is the presenting age? If someone walks in with relatively no myopia at the age of say 14, then you, we are very, uh, it's very unlikely that they will de develop high amounts of myopia or even one diopter of myopia, which we, which we saw from the previous slide is even one diopter is risky. Um, all, then the next one is the environment. Um, and this is a big debate um, in the field of research, especially as to myopia is, is it nature? Uh, or is it nurture? So is it genetics versus uh, how we are brought up or how our surroundings are? And um, we might have heard of these myths uh, when we were growing up. Oh, he's watching too much TV and he's not eating his veggies, etc. So that is the nurture part of it as to what is our environment. Though those things of watching TV and not eating too much, too many veggies or whatever have been myths. But yes, our environment shapes how our eye. Uh, I develops in childhood and the environment that we grew up in uh, definitely affects whether we will, uh, the question whether we will develop myopia and as also how much of myopia will be developed. Um, a lot of studies have shown that uh, outdoor time and exposure to sunlight in some way is either preventative or uh, helpful in slowing down the progression of myopia, but we will get into the details later on. Uh, next is the binocular vision status. So at presentation, uh, what is the binocular vision status of the individual if the individual has esotropia or accommodative lag, um, higher accommodative lag than a normal individual, then yes, that is considered as a risk factor because those individuals have been seen to have more uh, chances to develop myopia or have myopia progression. Lastly, it would be the refractive error. So we all know about the process of emetropization. And just in short, it's the process wherein um, 
a baby born who's generally born hyperopic uh, over the span of time as they grow, reach the stage of hematropia. But sometimes, or uh, in, in case half, by 2050, half the time, uh, they will progress beyond the stage of hematropia to become myopic. So the refractive error, especially at the age that they come in, uh, matters a lot. So if you see a minus two diopter in a two-year-old baby, yes, we are really concerned that that child is going to develop serious myopia complication. If you see about minus one diopter in a 20-year-old person, then yes, then we are not so concerned. So refractive error plays an important role. Um, having known all of these risk factors, what is the thing that we measure or we can understand or the thing that we can track and say, okay, uh, we are safe. We don't have to worry about myopia or we are not safe. We have to worry a lot more about myopia. So there are primarily two outcomes that we can really look into. And those are um, axial length and refractive error. Now, a lot of clinicians and eye care practitioners would zone out at this point, considering the fact that they do not have access to an axial length um, measurement machine, and it is expensive. It's not a very easy procedure. Um, so uh, there is the important part to remember here is that though axial length is still considered um, the primary point for a risk of myopia, uh, you can always, always, always correlate it with uh, refractive error. And uh, unless someone has gone uh, undergone like refractive error surgeries, you can always correlate with refractive error and use refractive error as your guide point or as your guideline to develop treatments or design treatments for your patient. So as I said, axial length is an ultimate indicator in sense of a refractive error. And when I said earlier that someone who's had refractive error surgeries they do not go, the risk of developing those associated diseases do not go away because refractive error surgeries affect your cornea or the um, crystalline lens, but the axial length remains the same. And most of these diseases are primarily associated with the change in axial length rather than the refractive error at the cornea or the crystalline lens change. So anyone with uh, axial length of more than 26 mm um, millimeters is, is at a significant risk for all of those conditions. Um, and the way uh, around 24 millimeters is considered the uh, normal for a normal axial length. But yeah, the text from uh, different texts would vary and different researchers would vary a little, but that is the average uh, parameter. <clears throat> normal axial length in a child, um, that is when I say a child up to 12 to 16 years of age changes by about 0.1 mm per year approximately. But again, as I said, uh, the research, we do not have enough data um, to have a specific criteria that by this age, this is the normal standard. And if anyone's below or above that, that is abnormal uh, because it's difficult to measure axial length for every patient every time they visit because not it's one, it's not an easy procedure. Um, Two, it's not cheap. And three, it also takes a certain amount of time. So yeah, we do not have the data and that's why um, the governing bodies or the deciding bodies have not put forth specific criteria, even though they consider HL length as a requirement or as a standard procedure, since there is no guideline as to what should be the normal minimum by what age, uh, <clears throat> it's very easy to say that either, any, any answer could be right at any given age. Uh, but refractive error, as I said, is closely related to axial length. As your axial length goes on increasing, so is the amount of myopia that you have. And hence, uh, you can use refractive error, which is very easy to measure for most of us um, using either an objective or subjective method. You can always track, um, you can estimate the amount of changes it's causing to axial length. Now, remember, in some cases, the refractive error may, <clears throat> there are two types of uh, hematropias uh, primarily, which is axial and the other is refractive. And so sometimes, and this is again, not very common, um, the percentages may vary from population to population, the changes would be refractive hematropia, but those are um, easy to catch because they do not change significantly over the years. Um, also at the same time, um, if you are worried or if you're concerned that the someone who you've been trying to treat with myopia control or myopia management might have refractive hematropia, then uh, a, one, one test of um, axial length can help you reveal whether 
their condition is refractive or um, axial in nature, as there be discrepancies between their refractive error measurement and their axial length um, uh, amount. And last, uh, understanding treatment success by refractive error. This is a very critical point in our care, uh, which is we will try to judge and guess how successful our treatment is by looking at the refractive errors primarily. So uh, what is treatment success and what is this progression that we are going to be looking at? So there are two categories that I would like to split the subjects into at this point, which is pre-myops and um, myops who are myops who have progression or how to look at progression. So for pre-myops, we really want to look at their family history, as I said, the genetic factors earlier, their environment. So currently uh, approximately at least 90 minutes or one and a half to two hours per day spending outdoors. And by outdoors, it means sun, spending time in sunlight and you don't have to go at uh, midday or noon um, and like, you know, have a risk of exposure to UV light or something, but yes, yeah, spending time in sunlight, probably in the evening or early morning. Um, also, um, a lot of patients would be like, uh, especially someone who is a myope would be, uh, you ask their parents, okay, this child has to be outdoor and spending time in sunlight. Uh, they will take their book or uh, phones outside and be on their phones or in their book or reading their books. That is shown to not help always. Uh, there is some discrepancy, but the idea of sending children outdoor primarily, especially in myopia progression, uh, which we are looking from the age of six to seven uh, on an average to 16 to 17, this is the most risk factor group, is to make sure that they spend uh, time looking at things that are distant or more than uh, a few feet or reading distance apart. And there has been some research that shows um, that outdoor time is primarily uh, helpful because students or children look at things um, that are at distance and not near. But again, um, the field is divided as to how outdoor time really helps. But yes, it does have a significant impact. Um, we already spoke about binocular vision. We really do not understand uh, so far, at least from what my understanding is, as to how certain binocular vision anomalies affect myopia primarily. But yes, there is an associated risk. So um, that is something you might want to check. And refractive errors, of course, what is the refractive error? So if a child of six to seven years of age walks in with less than 0.75 di diopters of hyperopia, say 0.5, or is already an e-metro, now, it, and you're doing a routine eye exam, you might want to increase the frequency. Like you, instead of calling them back in a year's time, you might want to call them back in six months time just for a simple refractive error check because um, they are at a high risk at that point uh, to develop myopia. And if you see that they are developing myopia, the best way or the, um, the best treatment is the one that is done the quickest. If you wait for two years and they've already developed three or four adapters of myopia, um, it's 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 a lost progress. So you would have you could have prevented uh, some of that myopia. So that that is important. Again, in progression, all of these factors are important, and this will help us define our uh, management plans. Uh, also, ethnicity, if especially uh, East Asian, uh, that is people from uh, China, Japan, Korea, etc., have been shown to have much 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 higher risk of developing myopia. Uh, so. That is something that you want to keep in mind if you are looking at or if you are managing such patients. Um, so yeah, in progression, their progression might vary a little bit as compared to the other population or Caucasians as most of the research define it as. So the next, um, now that we know what are the risk factors and how we are going to assess them, what are the things that we should be looking at, uh, what are the different management options that are available out there? and um, as I said, we have been treating myopia, at least the symptoms of myopia, with um, glasses, contact lenses, and refractive error surgeries. The myopia management, um, though, uses the same tools primarily, but is a little different. Uh, before understanding what these options are, it is very important for you to educate your patients and the child's parents 
very clearly as to what this myopia management, any of the option that they decide or you decide for them, what are they going to do? What should be their expectations? Because setting expectations has been, um, is, is crucial, especially for this condition. And uh, if the wrong expectations are set, you might miss the patient or uh, the parents might feel misguided and they might give up faith in this. And that, that would be a loss of a patient and potentially down the line, it might cost them their vision. And we do not want to do that. So from the get-go itself, the first time you think about talking about myopia to them, you might want to set the, right, the expectations right. And this is somehow limited with the amount of research we have. But at the same time, um, the field has been looking for myopia management treatment or expectations for a long time. So it has been developed wherein you can really tell them a lot about it. So the first is myopia management is not a perfect solution. It's not a pill or a drop that you put in the eye and magically you will never develop myopia. There is no guaranteed answer or guaranteed um, outcome of it. The easiest way to explain this to patients sometimes is if they understand glaucoma or if as clinicians, if we understand glaucoma, um, it's kind of the same analogy. So when someone walks in and we suspect them of having glaucoma, we do the eye pressure, uh, which the eye pressure or the IOP can be equated to refractive error in this case. And you see, oh, the refractive error is uh, myopic for this age range. And the eye pressure, or probably in glaucoma, the eye pressure is too high. What we do is, uh, or what an ophthalmologist would do is prescribe certain drugs. Um, they would record their, um, the, the visual field and probably their um, OCT, RNFL thickness, et cetera, and then prescribe them certain drugs that they think would suit them or treat them best. And that is what we are going to be doing with myopia management. We feel the refractive error is too high or too myopic at this point. Uh, for this age, we do certain recordings, if possible, axial length, um, the binocular vision measurements, certain binocular vision measurements. And we, uh, to our best judgment of the patient condition, we prescribe them with a the treatment. Um, that will help uh, to alleviate their symptomatic symptoms. That is, they will be able to see clearly. And just in case of glaucoma, um, their eye pressure will go lower. But we also know there is a condition called normal tension glaucoma, or we do not clearly know how much low the eye pressure has to go uh, until the damage on the RNFL and the visual field is stopped. And for that, the ophthalmologist will call them back in a few months time, probably in a six months time for a follow-up. He will repeat all those tests to see what is the difference. If the damage is still progressing, if he sees the damage is still happening, then he would suggest a different treatment. And same goes for myopia management. In about six months time, you want your patients to come back and you will repeat certain tests, primarily refractive error, to see if the refractive error is still progressing. If it is progressing at an um, accelerated rate, then you know that the treatment you gave was not, no, is not working as you expected and you might want to modify it. And this is the expectation you have to set from your patients. This is not magic or it's not a magical pill that you pop in and you're done. It's solved. You don't have to worry about it. It's going to be an ongoing treatment plan with regular or frequent follow-ups. And so the patients have to understand them with get-go because with spectacles, generally most uh, adults are used to wearing one single prescription for a really long duration or time or not coming back for an eye checkup until and unless they've broken or lost their glasses. The other thing is to uh, clearly mention or understand that even 0.25 or 0.5 diopters of increase in myopia is considered a successful treatment because that is a potentially a much, much, much lesser um, than what the myopia would have developed without the treatment. And I would like to bring your attention to this um, diagram over here um, that I've been able to use from myopia profile. Um, that is the average change per year for someone less than nine years of age is about one diopters or 1.25 diopters. Research is very a little bit here and there. For nine to 11 years of age is about 0.5 diopters. And this is wearing their single vision spectacle lenses. And 12 to 16 years of age is about 0.5 diopters. And this is again, average change. So not every patient is going to stick to this guideline. Um, but at the same time, one diopters less than nine years, if you start developing myopia at six years of age, by the time you reach 16, you would have developed significant amount of myopia if your progression doesn't stop. And we want to make sure that it is either reducing at, it is either increasing at 0.5 or 0.25, which is the lowest possible uh, in most cases. 
treatment may need to be modified if not successful at first try, as I mentioned before, in, as in case of glaucoma. Efficacy is how bad the progression would be otherwise. So we'll speak about efficacy percentages, which will talk about um, how bad the progression would happen if we do not Im implement these myopia management treatment. Uh, efficacy is again, not the same for everyone. Even if there are two twins, one might respond differently to the other. We do not understand um, we do not understand why this happens. Um, and there is also a lot of um, uh, unclear area because of lack of data and lack of research. But yes, efficacy from one child to the other might differ, uh, even though you do almost everything same. Um, regular monitoring is necessary because this can also be a point of contention. Oh, this optometrist or eye care practitioner just wants to make do business or make money. And that's why they want me to come back every six months. Etc. And then if you ask them to change their glasses or contact lenses or treatment, uh, and because their myopia has increased, they'll be like, okay, you said this would work, uh, this didn't work, and now we have to change our glasses and spend money for those glasses. So yeah, um, regular monitoring is going to be necessary and you want to tell that upfront. There is no, not a, there is not a definitive endpoint. So you don't know when, like if you do this for one year, are you safe? If you do this for two years, are you safe? Approximately uh, somewhere between 14 to 16 years of age, <clears throat> the progression slows down for most individuals. And the best way or the only way to test it rather is to get them off of the treatment, monitor them for six months and see if, if they bounce back or if they are if the accelerated progression is happening, then we put them back on treatment for a year or two and hope that after that it will stop. But there is no definitive age or okay, by your 14th birthday, it's going to stop or I can guarantee it can stop. No, there is no such age. And again, as I said before, LASIK surgeries do not change axial length. They might change your refractive error. And so you might not want, have to wear spectacles or contact lenses, but they will not change your axial length and the risk remains. So spectacles, there are primarily two, um, two options. One is progressive additional lenses or PALS uh, and bifocals. Uh, especially with 3D based in prisms and the efficacy is 33%. So when I say efficacy is 33%, um, it, all it means is if you were, if a person was going to progress by say um, one diopter without all of these treatment and uh, less than nine years of age, and they would progress by one diopter over a span of year, uh, this, per this person who's using one of these treatment options is likely, again, not all patients, but it's likely to progress by about uh, 0.6 or 0.7 diopters. So it's 33% effective and it might not work in all patients all the time. Um, so, Progressive addition lenses and prescribing them to kids, um, especially with bi bi bifocals or PALS, is, is tricky. And this is, um, for the interest of time, I will not go into a lot of details of how this should be best done, but just to know that this is an option and a few things that we should always keep in mind while using this, especially what the evidence research is showing, is if patients have esophoria or accommodative lag, uh, so if the child comes in with one of these conditions, and if you have to have to prescribe them spectacles, um, then PALS or progressive addi addition lenses uh, would be the best option. They, um, uh, and especially like if you cannot prescribe them contact lens, so contact lens um, is an ideal case option as you will see later on. But if you cannot do that for whatsoever reason, if they have some other ocular conditions or they don't want to, then PALS could be a good segue. Um, but remember while you're prescribing them, one of the important things is to have a no narrow corridor from the distance vision segment to the near vision segment. The corridor should be as narrow as possible. So the reading transition is super quick because that will be most beneficial to them. Having a long corridor and giving them an intermediate zone, a large intermediate zone might not be very beneficial. Um, bifocals or 3D base in prisms, these would be as opposed to uh, progressive addition lenses would be ideal or would be um, best suited for someone who has orthophoria when they walk in or is uh, exophoria. Uh, or normal accommodation with lag less than one diopter, then you want to go with bifocals. Now, especially with kids, bifocals, it's it's tricky, it's difficult. They don't want to be seen with those glasses. So again, as I said, contact lens would be the best option, but if you cannot prescribe and if the parents can understand um, 
than bifocals. But in bifocals, you have to use E-segment or executive bifocals, um, which is a horizontal line across the lens uh, only and, and not D bifocals or um, uh, any of the other forms of bifocals because these are the most effective ones. The other ones, we do not have a lot of evidence, but again, whatever evidence we have points to saying that they are not effective. Um, and maybe a combination therapy is needed if you're prescribing spectacles for whatsoever reason. We will come to combination therapies in a few minutes. Contact lenses, um, this is again, this is a higher efficacy, so 50%. So if a patient was going to advance by one, progress by one diopter, with these contact lenses, highly likely that in the next year or so, they only progress by half a diopter. If they're going to progress by half a diopter and a normal rate, it's highly likely they only progress by 0.25 diopters. Your two options primarily are multifocal soft contact lenses. There are a lot of brands available out there and uh, a lot of our industries are putting money into this research and specific um, myopia control contact lenses have also been manufactured like my site. If they're not available in your country, they, they might soon become available. And the other option is orthokeratology. So uh, multifocal soft contact lenses work best or are ideal so far, especially in terms of availability and not terms of optics for low astigma, uh, astigmatism because uh, we don't have a lot of options for uh, people multifocal soft contact lenses with astigmatism. Then uh, there are specialty lenses, just as I said, as my site is a specific myopia control lens, uh, which if available would be your ideal option. Uh, the biggest point of contention or what patients fear the most is the risk of infection. Uh, if you're prescribing daily disposable, <clears throat> It's two in per 10,000 years of wear. So if your patient were to wear daily disposable, not the same lens, but daily disposable for 10,000 years, it's highly, it's only likely that twice in those 10,000 years duration, they will get uh, a significant eye infection that will affect their eye. Um, in case of uh, monthly reusables, if they're not affording daily disposables or if they're not available, uh, then it's 12 in 10,000 years. So if your patient were to wear the lenses 10,000 years, there's only 12 times that they would get a significant eye infection, which is a very low risk as compared to the risk if they develop high myopia without, on, without any of these treatment. Uh, the next, as I said, is ortho-K. Um, this is not suitable for all patients, especially high astigmatism uh, or oblique astigmatism, particularly as fitting might be tricky. I will not delve into the detail as orthokeratology fitting itself is a very vast topic. And so I'll not delve into the detail of how the fitting should be done, but know that this is an option. And if you plan to expand your practice into myopia management, uh, it, it would be the best time to, to go ahead and learn about fitting orthokeratology lenses. Uh, may be necessary again to use combination therapy and we will come to that uh, at a later point. Um, so the next is uh, pharma pharmacological agents that is atropine um, or uh, which has 50% efficacy. So pharmacological agents, atropine is the best known and it has about 50% efficacy, but um, the concentration that should be ideally used, at least what research shows is 0.01% concentration of atropine um, because anything more will have side effects. And by side effects, we don't know of any long-term side effects as of yet, but um, the pupil as atropine is meant to dilate pupils and reduce um, accommodation. A child who's going to school would not want dilated pupils and reduce accommodation when they can't read. So that is the problem on that end. And anything um, lower might have issues like the treatment might, might not affect. So putting those drops would not be helpful at all. Um, but again, the jury is out there. Um, and yes, the treatments could be modified if necessary. Um, the side effects, as I said, is reduced accommodative amplitude and um, pupil dilation. Um, but by one mm, if you're using 0 0.01 and one mm pupil dilation should not affect their work and even reduce your accommodative amplitude. With kids, they have a large accommodative amplitude. So if you're using this concentration, it should not affect any of their day-to-day -day activities. Um, the, the negative part or the not so nice part about this treatment is there is a rebound effect of the treatment after the treatment is stopped. So if you do this treatment for four or five years, then you stop and um, don't treat the patient any further on this, then um, the patient might 
actually start progressing my opinion much faster and rebound to as it would have happened if you would have not done the treatment at all so that is why this treatment alone is not the best line of treatment or is not the best what um, clinicians across the world are considering but at the same time it is also helpful as it is 50% efficacy and no other um, additional um, specific types of contact lenses or glasses they can just wear their normal glasses or contact lenses uh, and treatment results are not consistent as i said not every patient will be affected the same way and there are no theories so far as to how it affects the eye so what are the other changes that are happening or what actually is being changed when we put atropine as a drug in the eye for a long term duration we really do not know that or no theories are out there so that also makes it scary if you tell the patient oh, well we're going to put this drug it might help you but we don't know what it's really doing so you know um, pray for it so that is a scary thought for anyone the next is combination therapy which is again 50% efficacy but especially for the patients who are not doing well on the other therapies or if you're just being able to prescribe them spectacles as uh, pals or uh, bifocals then having a combination that is a pharmacological lesion that is atropine plus their contact lenses or spectacle um has shown to have higher chances of success but again more research is necessary but definitely higher chances of success if only one method does not work um so that is all about the treatments that are out there currently uh, more are in development but um yeah we will update once we know what the other options are so what are the current advances and sometimes parents get very inquisitive as to you know what, what can we expect or you know is there anything uh, under research that might be necessary that they can learn so here are some things that you can talk to them about a systematic review in jan 2020 showed combination therapy has the best effect um of all the treatments so these are the current advances of course it has to be tested further myopia onset so as i said time outdoors we are not really sure what helps but just time outdoor helps but what factor so uh, certain research shows that the on myopia onset can be prevented by time outdoors and not myopia progression so once you, you once you have even 2.5 diopters of myopia um living outdoors forever is also not going to prevent the progression but before you have it even like 90 minutes or 2 hours per day outdoors can stop or prevent the uh, onset uh, the next is myopia progression can be altered by a uh, stimulation with specific light wavelengths of light so blue light versus red light but again the jury is out there we don't know anything for sure customizing myopia treatment may be a solution to increasing efficacy this is something i am working on as to how much ad should be provided and um at what periphery etc uh, in the multifocal contact lenses and 7mx with its seven methyl xanthine may slow myopia progression so this is also another um uh, compound found in coffee that has been shown to slow myopia progression again not very strongly so do not advise your uh, patients to make their kids drink coffee all day but at the same time yes this is something that might come in the future um uh so i'll just go through quickly through two case studies um it shouldn't take long they are very simple so one is uh, twins that are 11 years old child one has refraction both the child actually have refraction uh, so refraction um, myopia and child one has two diopters child two has um, child two has four diopters but child one has axial length of 26.1 mm in both eyes and child two has 24.5 mm in both eyes so in this case the question is which child has the worst diagnosis so always look at the axial length um that is the primary factor even though they are both same age etc the axial length is the primary factor the refraction should not be considered in this case uh and child 1 has the worst diagnosis and you want to worry about child 1 more than child 2 of course both need myopia management but at the same time if someone is to ask you wait uh, which one is worse because refractive error for child 2 is worse child 1 is worst for sure because they have much more risk of having other issues later on in life so yes an increased axial length means an increased risk for other ocular problem so that is your um answer for this one case study 2 is a 7 year old uh, shows up for routine eye exam refractive error of point uh, five diopters in both eyes esophoria present um now 
we know that esophoria is um, an risk factor. And at seven years, even 0.5 diopters of hyperopia could be considered as a risk factor. But well, you can't prescribe myopia management to someone who doesn't have myopia. So what should your management be in this case? One is to do six monthly follow-up or sooner follow-ups so that you can catch as soon as the refractive error changes. Educate, educate the parents and child about one, the outdoor time that they should spend, the reduced screen time uh, to avoid near devices or like, you know, not more than two hours of screen digital devices after school or outside school at least. And the 2020 rule. I know it comes into play a lot for dry eyes, but um, is also super helpful for myopia as well. So it's not about blinking 20 times, but it's about at, after every 20 minutes, uh, look at a 20 feet distance or uh, six meter distance if possible outside the window, et cetera, for 20 seconds. So that is the 2020-20 rule, especially in case of myopia. Um, so that's the second case study. And the last thing I want to share is certain resources. Um, so subscribe to Forop Tom. It's an amazing learning platform and hopefully any advances I will be able to share with this platform. Um, most of this information came from Myopia Profile, which is an online platform um, put together by Dr. Kate Schiffer. Um, it's free and it's very clinical oriented, but at the same time has a lot of research details. So if you're willing or wanting to study in depth about how to prescribe, uh, what are the parameters, et cetera, that would be a great place. Um, and the next one is BHBI Myopia Calculator. Um, go on to this, play around with this calculator. This is a great resource to show your patients as to what their child's myopia will progress to if you do not correct or uh, rectify that at an early stage. And the last is if you are a research-oriented person and are seriously interested in learning about the up, new and upcoming research, look for International Myopia Institute. Um, they combine all the research worldwide into a digestible, readable formats. So yeah, that is something that you can read up if you're interested in that. But with that, um, I would say join the resistance today uh, because myopic eyes matter um, and help prevent the myopia progression and the doom that we would face by 2050 if we don't do anything. I would like to acknowledge um, Dr. Andrew Pucker, who is my mentor, um, Myopia Profile and Dr. Kate Gifford for putting this platform together. Uh, that is helpful for people worldwide. For Optom team for this opportunity and the UAB School of Optometry for the platform and learning that I'm doing all the, all the time. Uh, and with that, uh, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much. And I will take any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kier. That was a wonderful presentation. And I am sure, like me, our audiences have also immensely enjoyed it. So moving on to the question, the first question we're receiving is from Ms. Simran, who asks, how do we convince the parents for myopia management for their children? So uh, there are a lot of factors that I pointed out, um, especially um, first, you want to start with the risk factors as to what are the risks and the BHBI uh, calculator, uh, BHBI myopia calculator is a great uh, visual tool to show them what their myopia progression, their child's myopia progression could be like. And you can play around and know some of the outcomes before. And it is research backed. So there are references to uh, papers that if the parents want to read up later on, you can give it to them that from these papers or these studies, I'm telling you all of these. So it's strongly research backed. Uh, the second thing um, is you want to. Uh, choose a treatment for them or help them understand the reduced risk of treatments. Um, one of the biggest fear is contact lenses. Uh, they will cause infection and dry eyes, et cetera. But you have to show them the reduced risk that it is not that risky, uh, especially uh, even, even though it's their child, like they'll be like, oh, they don't know how to put them in, et cetera. It only takes 15 minutes or so extra as a practitioner to teach them. Um, as compared to an adult. So it's the reduced risk of treatment that you have to show them. Um, that is the two primary points. Again, um, there aren't, all these treatments aren't FDA approved, but there, as I said, my site is a specific myopia control lens. Uh, and there are certain lenses coming out in the market uh, currently that are FDA approved. So it's not like um, FDA approved uh, prescriptions or drugs, et cetera, are not uh, harmful generally. They, they take care or they understand the risks before they prescribe. So yeah, that's the best way to go about it. Um, 
but yeah other than that just spreading the awareness and if the parents themselves have myopia they probably are likely to understand also showing them the benefits of uh, wearing contact lenses like you know being able to perform better sports um, better confidence etc for their child might help so these are the few things you can do um, but at the same time uh, the worst case scenario if you cannot convince ask them request them even if you have to provide a free refraction after 6 months ask them to come back for a refraction after 6 months because if the child if you suspect the child has myopia the ch- at certain ages they will progress and once they progress and if you're like um, you know you can tell them this is what i fear that if we don't do anything right now they're going to keep progressing and that would be your best um, weapon or the best um, thing that you can use to convince them uh similarly moving on to the next question it's by mr himan shu who asks uh with spectacle correction the central retina gets the focused image but the peripheral retina remains the same and it leads to hyperopic defocus which then uh, leads to myopia so what is the correct method to correct myopia with the uh, spectacles so uh so my primary area of research is peripheral refraction i've been studying peripheral refraction since almost 2015 so this is a uh, very research oriented topic um, but yes um, it's it's a perfect question excellent question um spectacle correction does lead to defocused image so ideally correcting them with multifocal or orthokeratology will take care of the periphery so that will uh, change the peripheral hyperopic defocus to myopic defocus and hence the increased efficacy of those treatments but at the same time there is even though the field is slowly moving away from spectacle corrections uh, th- we all know that there are certain cases even in adults when we cannot prescribe spectacle correction uh sorry contact lens correction at all like they have certain syndromes or dry eyes etc and if this if you have a child or a patient that shows up like that or the parent is too poor to afford contact lenses or reluctant or if hygiene is a concern then um spectacles or have been shown as i said pals and bifocals and there is some uh, understanding that it has to do something with near work Uh, again we do not know how the process exactly works and how all of this is controlled because there are animal studies that show that i could pres- i could fit half a contact lens or half a spectacle to an animal's eye and only that half of the eye will elongate and the other half won't so we know it's a very area specific uh, or locus specific stimulus but um, yes it's it's impossible for us to know what is exactly happening what is the mechanism so contact lens is your best option forward but at the same time spectacle correction uh, with uh, and pharmacological uh, com- combination treatment could be a solution if someone is not willing or is not able to wear spectacle uh, contact lenses so yeah so I, do you i think, hope that answers the question do you think the optical profile of the single vision lenses contribute to myopia progression that is another question from our audience uh well that is that is um i would say no uh the optical profile there are multiple factors again at play so uh if even if the optical pro- and there is no proof for, for now we know that multifocal lenses somehow help and we it's theorized that um it's the defocus but there is no proof of that um uh, but again at the same time even if single vision lenses are contributing to myopia progression uh, the uh, the contradiction is then uh, under correcting myopes which was the the rationale of treatment about 10 years ago or so under correcting myopes would have helped or would have slowed down progression but um we have strong evidence saying that there is under correcting myopes or uh, changing the defocus to um, myopic defocus in the periphery by doing that method is not causing any changes so um, again detailed understanding and detailed optics is a research limitation but at the same time uh, we we cannot confidently say that the spectacle profile of a single vision lens causes that but at the same time it is definitely not helping us prevent the progression so yeah and also you need to do a symptomatic relief for your patient your patient cannot go about with minus 2 or 4 diopters of myopia so you have to prescribe something 
and single vision lenses are not helping. And the next question is from Ms. Grishma, who wants to know the minimum requirements to start a myopia clinic. So, well, a minimum requirement primarily is knowledge of ortho K, multifocal contact lenses, how to fit these lenses to pediatrics, um, and the ability to do refractive error. If you have, um, I mean, if you have a clinic, then you should be able to do refractive error. That is primarily the minimum requirement. If you feel necessary, you don't have to do HL length for all patients, but if you feel necessary, you can always outsource one patient um, to a local ophthalmologist um, and a local eye hospital, but that is primarily the minimum requirement. Uh, also, you will need some kind of a BV setup. So um, you will need to be able to measure, which for standard uh, clinical practices, it comes with the trial box you'll be need to be able to measure the esophoria, exophoria, uh, and things like that. So that is primarily all of it. That would be the minimum to get you started with. So it's not a big barrier to entry apart from the knowledge of how to fit and prescribe these contact lenses. Uh, we and have talked about using orthokeratology uh, for myopia control. So what are some of the challenges of using orthokeratology? So the challenges, one is... Um, the chair time, it takes a lot of chair time. Uh, and it's not just one visit, the patient will come back for refit, et cetera. Um, the other is you cannot fit it to someone who has high astigmatism, 1.5 diopters or more of astigmatism. You really cannot do orthokeratology. Oblique astigmatism, uh, again, makes it tricky. Uh, sometimes patient tolerance, uh, some patients are very sensitive, their corneas are very sensitive. So even after a day or two, they will not get adjusted or accommodated to those uh, lenses. Um, also, some sometimes you might find that uh, even though you change lenses multiple times, you do not reach the preferred or desired outcome. And the patient still has to wear contact lenses during the day or spectacle lenses during the day for a residual amount of myopia that the ortho care is not being able to correct. Um, high myopes, uh, 10 diopters or say, again, ortho care would be very tricky. So yeah, these are some of the primary, primary challenges that some of the other treatments can somehow or can do a little better to alleviate, uh, whereas ortho care would fail. So uh, while talking about the clinical setup, you also talked about the binocular vision. So how does the vision therapy help slow myopia progression? Vision therapy, uh, the jury is out there that vision therapy helps slow myopia progression. Um, but again, yes, there have been studies that show um, <clears throat> that alleviating accommodation primarily or accommodative effort on the eye somehow slows myopia progression. So a lot of students who've studied um, optometry, uh, say about five, six years ago, they would have uh, seen a lot of correlation during their studies between near work and myopia. So near work associated with myopia, et cetera. The research has moved away from it because there is strong evidence that near work only um, on its own cannot cause myopia, but alleviating some of the near work effort um, in which is where vision therapy comes in um, might prevent or help slow down myopia progression. But again, as I said, it's not the only factor. So just doing that would potentially not give us any beneficial results. Uh, similarly, uh, next question from our audience is, uh, does lenticular lens and aspheric lenses help in myopia management? Uh, lenticular lenses and aspheric lenses. Uh, well, aspheric lenses per se, um, no, would not help in myopia management. Uh, for lenticular lenses, um, that is, that is again, I would go with no. I do not know if there is any evidence out there because again, not a lot of patients need lenticular lenses and doing some research requiring those patients um, is tricky. Uh, but there is no evidence out there. So I would not be very confident on saying, okay, they do not help definitely. But yeah, uh, there is no evidence about that. And aspheric lenses uh, do not provide the necessary change in optics, at least to the required amount to uh, help us show any significant progression. If your myopia is supposed to progress by one diopter and it only progressed by 0.9 diopters, well, 0.1 diopter difference is very hard to show clinically because we can't even measure that while doing the refraction. So yeah, that's, just, that's the story for um, 
Thank Sorry. you. Thank you. We wrapped up with our questions now. And on behalf of our Optum team and our audience, I would like to thank Mr. Kiyor for giving us the time and the knowledge and the lovely experience today. And I would also like to thank our audience for being so supportive, interactive, and attentive. So this brings us to the end of the session, and we will be back with more programs and sessions. Meanwhile, please like the video, subscribe to our channel, like Mr. Kiyor already said. You can also visit us at www foroptom.com and also follow us on social media facebook instagram whatsapp stay home stay safe and have a good day thank you thank you